First, let me apologize for not being Dick Moran, <laughs> who should have been here but uh, had a family medical emergency. Um, my remarks today are going to stand under the slogan that unity, where we mean unity of the self in the sense of this session, is not one thing. So in this session, our topic is something like stories without se uh, cells without stories, and it highlights the synchronic unity of the self by contrast to the special diachronic narrative form of unity that was the focus yesterday. But the synchronic diachronic distinction can be a little misleading in this context, so I'm going to start out with a remark about what I think does and, more importantly, does not follow from that way of carving the terrain. And then I'll try to build on the papers of my fellow panelists to distinguish five different kinds of unity of the self that you might pursue, um, all of which are distinct from the properly narrative kind that people talked about yesterday. <clears throat> Winston Chong's paper indicates the possibility that there might be trade-offs of some sort among uh, these different kinds of unity, so that enhanced integration in one dimension might be associated with decreased uh, unity in some other. But I want to suggest in the end that nevertheless, if we carefully maintain focus on the distinctions among the different kinds of unity, it can still make sense to think of synchronic unity of the self overall as an ideal to be approximated, even though not uh, an essential property of selfhood as such. So, let me start out with a word on the concept of synchronic unity that's, that I think is at stake here. It's first important to avoid an overly demanding conception of how much unity is supposed to be involved. It's not supposed to be so strong as to exclude all ambivalence of thought and action. So, for example, some uncertainty about what to believe or a temptation to pursue uh, some other course of action than the one that I'm doing now might be compatible with synchronic unity as long as the agent retains sufficient self-control to have uh, suitably coherent patterns of belief and action in the end. Second point, a focus on the synchronic should not be taken to restrict our attention entirely to cognition or action in the immediate moment. On the contrary, the sort of unity I think we should seek under this title is often manifested only through coherence of the agent's life over time, for example, when her life is unified by some virtue or other disposition of character that manifests in a bunch of different situations and circumstances. What separates unity of that sort, or the failure of unity of that sort from the narrative kind under discussion yesterday, is not restriction to the immediate moment, but some basis in non-temporal relations among the agent's standing attitudes, or between the standing attitudes and some more current uh, uh, states or reactions. Such unity is synchronic in the sense that the integrating structure itself doesn't have to involve temporal shape of the sort that is essential to a narrative, or a plan, or a process of belief change across time, or something like that. With these qualifications in place, uh, let me talk about a few different kinds of uh, unity that I think deserve consideration. So one of the primary ways that we unify our practical lives is through value. Unlike mere desires or drives, values express an attachment to their object that aims to stabilize the agent's practical commitments in the face of disorder or variation in our circumstances. When we value something, we not only endorse it now, but we subject ourselves to a certain amount of rational pressure to keep on valuing it. The value gives us an internal reason to protect what we value, and if it's threatened by external circumstances or even by drift in our own commitments, then the rational pressure enters the scene and underwrites either self-criticism, if we're failing to live up to the value, or regret, if luck is making us uh, lose touch with it, or Maybe we think that the value ought to be abandoned and the rational pressure is there to enforce a kind of rational reconsideration of the value itself. So this is the kind of point that's made in the literature a lot. I've been thinking about it because of George Dannenberg's work on Promising, but uh, lots of people make that kind of point. And it's that stabilizing power of value that I think connects Thomas Pavel's rich account of this double look that he was talking about that's involved in certain kinds of engagement with fiction to our present questions about the unity of the self. So the threat to unity that's alive in the Pavel paper 
is our ineluctable exposure to accidents that are visited on us by the chaotic world that doesn't care about our needs or interests, or else uh, from our own inconstancy or propensity to let ourselves down. In the face of vulnerabilities like that, the self strives to maintain some kind of stability of practical commitment by attending not merely to the variable real circumstances, but simultaneously by what Pavel in the paper was calling the double look up to the shining stars, to that fixed ideal that's represented through our valuing attitudes. For Pavel, that stabilizing potential can even be directly felt, even in those cases where we can't fully articulate it. And this was the point he was pushing at the end of the paper, where he was complaining about Kantians like me, <laughs> have an extra thought too many about our, <laughs> about our moral obligations instead of just responding. Right? So he was echoing the Williams point about the thought too many there. Um, and he thinks that uh, Pavel was uh, thinking in the paper that we have this uh, implicitly felt sense of uh, value and commitment through this feeling he calls incumbency, which is essentially some kind of sense of responsibility toward the ideal that we value or toward some uh, uh, instance of it. So I guess one initial thought to your closing question would be, uh, look, you could feel incumbency toward the value itself just as much as toward the call of some particular other who uh, uh, makes the val value salient in the, in the moment. One point I want to make about that is that by contrast to the special sort of role that literary models were uh, supposed to have yesterday on this Pavel picture, the events of fictional narratives are entering not as a source of unity for the self, but here in the guise of a potentially disruptive set of accidents with the potential to atomize us, as he puts it toward the end of his paper. Valuing aims to hold the self together in the face of those disruptive events by relating the events to this fixed ideal above them, holding the events and holding ourselves up to that standard. The kind of consistency the self thereby acquires does not itself have a diachronic structure. In the cases that Pavel is interested in, the various events of letting ourselves down or living up to our values are each severally related to the ideal standing above them all, regardless of when or in what order they mm -hmm. happen. A similar thought can animate a conception of unity on the cognitive rather than the conative side of the psychological ledger. Here, Socrates stands out as a clear exponent of the demand for consistency of belief as a form of unity in psychological life. The project of Socratic challenge and Olympus is aimed at cleaning up our psychic accounts by addressing a particular kind of failure of unity and inconsistency of belief that leaves a person open to criticism from the standpoint of her own commitments. Even though conflicting beliefs could be elicited at separate moments in the dialectic, still the mode of unity at issue here is rightly understood as a synchronic one, because what's at stake are something like timeless logical relations of coherence or incoherence among the beliefs themselves, and not any temporal facts about when they emerged uh, or when they got expressed. In my joint paper with Joshua Landy that we set up for the session when uh, Moran pulled out, um, we canvassed Montaigne's account of Tacitus in the essay on the art of discussion to suggest that such cognitive unity can come apart from unity of character that's rooted in values or virtues. In Montaigne's view, Tacitus' condemnations of Pompey fail to accord with his own evidence, thereby compromising the sort of logical unity among beliefs that was praised by Socrates. But Montaigne traces the roots of that failure of cognitive unity to the very consistency of Tacitus' commitment to a certain kind of austere public virtue which can't really quite bring itself to be fully fair to a person like Pompey who's willing to risk the demise of the Republic to advance his own personal ambitions. And in fact, this failure of cognitive unity itself depends on the very same virtue. Tacitus, in Montaigne's mind, refuses to slant the facts one little bit to bring Pompey's uh, behavior in accord with the evidence about Pompey's behavior in accord with his own evaluation of how bad it was. And so here, what goes on is that the cognitive disunity, the mismatch between the evidence Tacitus himself presents and the judgment that he makes about Pompey, arises from and manifest the very same underlying unity of character, the virtue that he has of uh, uh, being quite upright, 
um, showing that the two modes of synchronic unity, the coherence among the logical beliefs and the coherence among the virtues of character, can't be the same. So the two forms of unity I discussed so far uh, concern personal level attitudes of the agent, attitudes that can serve both as apt targets of and effective means within conscious and deliberate efforts of self-management in the service of unity of the self. But Winston Chong's paper identifies two further forms of integration that operate at a subpersonal level, the default network and the salience. From the point of view of my theme, the most important feature of his discussion is uh, that these two networks are anti-correlated uh, in certain experimental contexts. That's connected to the fact that the salience network is so-called task positive and the default network task negative. I gather from our exchanges before the conference that there remains some controversy in the literature about the proper interpretation of this anti-correlation. I myself speculate, but what do I know? I speculate <laughs> that at least under certain circumstances, there may be some actual trade-offs between the two networks in concrete cases in operation. But in other cases, uh, the networks do seem to need to operate together and uh, may even become mutually reinforcing. And Winston has interesting things to say about that. So he himself advocates a hierarchical relation between the salience network and the default network, where the salience network has the role of regulating the default network. But however the details turn out here, the key conceptual point remains, namely, that here we have two fundamentally different kinds of unity or integration that rely on separate bases in these two separate networks uh, to support the brain's capacity to bring together separated activity into coherent uh, thought and action. The basic conceptual separation between these two types of integrated structure explains why it's even so much as conceptually possible that there might be competition um, between the two. The relevant difference is manifested by the separate characteristic forms of failure of these two different networks in the two different kinds of dimensions that uh, uh, Winston pointed out to us. And that returns us a, a little bit to the synchronic diachronic distinction. The distinctive type of integration provided by the default network concerns capacities to integrate thought and action across time in plans and in simulations about the future and the past and stuff like that. These are capacities which fail in Alzheimer's dementia. By contrast, the salience network involves the integration of distributed attentional resources that are needed to respond in the present moment in a way that flexibly coordinates thought and action in light of the self's total <coughs> interest. So failures of integration in this network, uh, Winston was claiming, um, occur in frontotemporal dementia, and they impair the sort of moment-to-moment -moment guidance in light of the agent's standing interests that we saw in uh, some of the videos that he showed us. So the basic distinction that Chong emphasizes between the two networks supports, I think, the abstract conclusion that I want to push here, namely that what we call unity of the self simply cannot be one thing, but must consist in different types of integration that contribute basically different unifying structures toward the overall goal of rendering coherent thought and action uh, for the agent. To the modes of psychological integration addressed already, one could add still others. If Dick Moran were here, he would have talked about the integration of disparate first-order attitudes through higher-order attitudes of endorsement or rejection along the lines of the Frankfurt-style uh, hierarchical model of the self that's been important in philosophy. That would be a fifth kind of unity, and I could name uh, others, but I'll stop. Um, uh, the distinction and even potential competition among these various modes of synchronic unity raises a different kind of question, and I want to conclude with that. That question is something like this. Does it make sense to envision any kind of meta-level form of unity that would consolidate the different modes of uh, integration with one another? Clearly, the anti-correlations identified by Chong at the subpersonal level and by Montaigne's reading of Tacitus at the personal level show that different modes of integration can come apart from one another and may even maneuver into open competition. In my view, it follows that such a meta-level unity of the self could only be thought of as a particular kind of achievement of a person rather than as a fixed property. 
And to my mind, that fact undermines traditional philosophical efforts to ground the self and its unity metaphysically, for example, by tracing it back to simplicity of the conscious substance or something like that. But beyond that concession, we can still ask whether it makes sense to think of unity of the self even as a norm or a kind of achievement, as I was suggesting at the beginning. And in the next session, my colleague Elijah Milgram, who always is ready to stand up and deny the obvious, um, <laughs> will argue in the negative. Some of his worries surround specific paradoxes that affect global efforts at self-control, and I think we'll hear more about that. But other uh, forms of his skepticism suggest that the, de the demand for unity itself as a norm can kind of trap agents into premature convergence on a suboptimal solution in the prosecution of their life. Because any departure from how I've been so far will always look, from the point of view of these unity norms, like a violation. And therefore, the new and potentially better me is being systematically sacrificed on the altar of being true to my unified self. Against Lige, I submit that the sort of niche switching that he is concerned to preserve may or may not turn out to be a good thing for the agent. And the cases where it is a good thing will be, I think, ones in which the agent can offer some retrospective account of her life that validates the switch. Such a story will bring her different projects together and thus some form of unity reasserts itself. If it's a story, then of course we're back to the diachronic kind of unity that was under discussion yesterday, which may in fact be the most natural way to understand what it would be like to bring different modes of synchronic integration together into an overarching whole. But the thought I want to really close on today is that Montaigne's practice of philosophical essaying has something to teach us about the potential for synchronic patterns of meta-level overarching unity. In the first instance, Montaigne's essays worked as trials of his judgment tested out on all kinds of different subjects, thumbs and whether to parley and so forth and so on. But his crafting of those essays worked to unify the different sides of himself that were exposed through the various first order judgments, not by subsuming them all into one consistent system of beliefs or values, but instead as expressions of a coherent personality that emerges through a distinctive and unmistakable style a style that establishes a synchronic pattern within which his sometimes frankly conflicting beliefs and values and goals and judgments and other more locally integrated aspects of the self and life, all of those are supposed to have their places to assume within that overarching uh, pattern. The pattern of his life as presented is complex, as complicated as a person, but the literary form that he managed to build for it is so recognizable and a reader with some experience and taste will rarely misattribute the passage of Montaigne. And the echoes of him, later essayists in the tradition, are easy to hear. So if I'm right about Montaigne on this point, then perhaps even though the unity of the self is not one thing, we can nevertheless think of even a synchronic mode of global meta-level unity as something toward which it makes sense for at least some of us to aspire.